This is a brief introduction to the philosophy of mind. What are philosophers talking about when we're considering the nature of our mind? Well, to introduce the topic, let's think about the difference between physical states and mental states, or physical features of us and mental features. It's fairly easy to describe physical features of a person. So you can talk about their height, their weight, their hair color, the kinds of things we put on a driver's license. You could also talk about the color of their eyes, the length of the hair, whether they have hair, those kinds of things. And we can even talk about things that aren't initially easily observable, such as somebody's pulse or blood pressure, respirations, one's vital signs, that is, or even with some invasive techniques, we can tell somebody's cholesterol levels and sodium levels and so on. And it's fairly easy to describe these kinds of things. But it's much more difficult to describe mental features from observation, externally at least. It certainly is. So mental properties or mental states include what I'm putting as a single you know, word acronym, although the, the initial letters, I don't have a fancy sentence, it's just FEMBEDS. I thought that seemed to me easy to remember. So each of these letters stands for one kind of mental property or mental state. So P is for plans. You know, plans can be longer term, uh, typically what we mean here, to get a job or to go home next weekend, to go to a concert this summer, those kinds of things. We have hopes, uh, for example, a hope to graduate, uh, a hope to get a job, a hope to get an A in this course, something like that. We have intentions. Now, intentions are more direct than plans they're much more immediate. So the idea here would be an intention to move one's arm up, for example, and your arm goes up, or to clench one's fist, and your fist clenches. M is for memories. So we all have memories. They can be distant memories of our childhood. They can be recent memories, what we did in the last hour, etc. And then as we continue with the FEMBEDS acronym, we have B for beliefs next. Uh, these could be mathematical beliefs, you know, one plus one equals two, or much more complex mathematical beliefs. These could be moral beliefs. These could be, be beliefs formed from the senses, that it's light outside or it's cloudy, or those kinds of things that we experience with our five senses that help us form beliefs about the world. E for emotions, of course, anger, pride, enthusiasm, disgust, joy, anxiety, all those emotions that we experience. D for desires, got a desire to eat some pizza or to get some sleep. And then finally, the S, sensations. Now, these are much more direct than uh, what I was talking about with emotions, for example, sensations. Uh, a sense of pain in one's knee, a, an experience of pleasure, or a tickle, a burn, or the sensation of hunger, or vertigo. So those things, these things that fall into our groups of categories in the FEMBEDS, those are mental properties, and they're much harder to observe. Now notice there is a relationship between the physical states and mental states there is a causal relationship between the two. So physical states can produce or cause mental states. So a cut on one's finger will cause the experience of pain, the sensation of pain. A mental state, though, can also cause or produce physical states. So if one gets angry, that can increase your blood pressure, a physical state. So there are these causal connections back and forth between our physical characteristics that we have and our mental characteristics that we have. But the difference, of course, is physical states 
are public. That is, they can be observed by somebody else. Somebody else can see them. And uh, as we mentioned, by just looking at a person or maybe even taking some labs from the person. And mental states, though, are in contrast to that, are private. You can only directly observe your own mental states, not someone else's. Now, yes, we can look at somebody typically and see if they're happy or, or sad or angry. Uh, those would be mental states, those emotions. However, uh, people can act, right? Of course, you can act angry when you're not. You can act sad when you're not. And so it's really only mental states of our own, our, our internal mental states that we directly observe that we are confident about. So here is the mind-body problem, right? We can put it in a question. How are those physical states that we talked about related to the mental states that we have? How does our physical body and the characteristics that it has relate to our mind and the mental states that we experience? And I just here in this very brief, quick introduction, I'm going to talk about three different approaches to the answering this question. One is dualism, and I'm focusing on a particular type of dualism. There are many types, um, but I want to talk about dualism, uh, the idea that the mind is a non-physical substance. Now, for some, that might sound um, oxy, like an oxymoron, but for philosophers, uh, we talk about substances that are non-physical uh, all the time, and so the idea would be uh, uh, some philosophers think properties are non-physical and, and numbers being non-physical, uh, those kinds of things. So uh, a substance is anything that can have properties and, and be itself while changing properties. You might think of it that way. And in that sense, uh, the dualist says the mind is a non-physical substance. So we're not talking about property dualism, uh, one you know, other different kind of dualism. The thesis of the dualism we're considering is that the mind is ontologically independent of the brain and the body. So the mind could exist without the body. The mind could exist maybe after death, for example. That's the view of substance dualism, as this is often called. A second broad category of the way people respond to this mind-body question, how are physical states related to mental states, is physicalism. And here we're just gonna talk about two simple types. There are many different types of physicalism as well, um, but I wanna address the identity theory, so there's another video on that, devoted to that. It, it's the very simplest view of the mind and the body, the identity theory just says the mind is the brain. They are one and the same thing. The mind is the physical object, the brain. That's what has the mental states. That's what the mind is. And so it's pretty clear how those interact with one another when the mind is a physical object. Another type of physicalism that has become much, much more popular in the mid 20th century to contemporary times is that of functionalism. Now, I'm going to say this definition that the mind is a collection of functional states in a physical medium. Uh, we will have to explore that much more carefully in the videos on functionalism. Now, both of these versions of the philosophy of mind are physicalist. So both types affirm that the mind of a human is ontologically dependent on the brain. So uh, for the identity theory, it's ontologically dependent on the brain because it just is the brain. That's pretty simple. For functionalism, at least as a very... Uh, intuitive uh, and, and very incomplete analogy, um, the light 
if you're in a room with light bulbs providing light, that light that you're experiencing is ontologically dependent on the light bulbs that are producing it. So no light bulb, you don't have the light. And uh, functionalism, the kind we're examining at least, is a form of physicalism. It completely depends on some physical medium, but it doesn't have to be the brain. So we'll explore that much more carefully. Now, before we wrap up this very big picture overview of philosophy of mind, I do wanna give one argument for dualism that is a historical argument. It's rooted in Descartes and even uh, Augustine and even to a certain extent Plato before him. So a long history, a contemporary philosopher who endorses the modal argument would be Alvin Plantinga. Um, and so it begins with this idea. It's possible that I exist without my body. Notice it doesn't claim that I can definitely, that I do, sorry, exist without my body. It just says it's possible that I exist without my body. And then the second premise considers that idea and expands it, draws out an implication. If it's possible that I exist without my body, then I am not identical with my body. Think of it this way. Consider a, a pen or a pencil. So uh, uh, looking at a pen in front of me, and you, I think, is it possible for this pen to exist without this plastic and this metal and this ink within it, could those things not be here and yet the pen still be here? And clearly not, right? The answer to that question is not. So the dualist though in the modal argument says, but that's not the way it is with, with humans and our minds. I could exist without my body. And if that, that's true, then I'm not identical with my body, so then we can conclude I am not identical with my body. Now we can draw out a couple implications here. If I'm not identical with my body, then I'm certainly not identical with any other physical object, right? And this works, uh, the argument works, I'm not identical with my body or any part of my body. So this would include the idea that it's rejecting the idea that I'm identical with my brain, then it's an outright rejection of the identity theory. So if I'm not identical with my body, I'm not identical with any physical object, so obviously I'm not identical with a physical object, and that means that I must be a non-physical mind, which is the thesis of substance dualism. I am some non-physical mind. That's my nature. That's ultimately what I am as a human being. It's this non-physical mind that makes me what I am. So we have a lot of, of details to consider about all three of these positions. So we have other videos to watch with those other views explained and criticized.